welcome back to The Perspective. We're still talking to Professor John Doerr, uh, Vice uh, Chancellor and President of La Trobe University. So uh, what about La Trobe's relationship with Indonesia? Mm. Well, it, it's another very long-standing relationship. Um, we uh, have a very close relationship with UPH, um, and I'm going to go and visit there later today. Um, we have a student exchange, so students going in both directions. directions. Um, we also have a number of students studying in Indonesia under the new Colombo plan, um, doing a range of uh, what we call practicums, so they're placements in business so that students can really get under the skin of what it's like to work in an Indonesian organization, a, a business or a company. Hmm. Um, we also have students studying here on nursing programs. Um, because with, a lot of with UPH? Is, is yes, the yes, program that's with right, yes. yeah, exactly. Um, so there are a number of different uh, connections mm -hmm. um, and one of the reasons we're here is that we would like to expand those. Mm -hmm. We would like to create more opportunities for our students to come and gain experience in Indonesia. Um, just as we'd like to create more pathways for Indonesian students to come to Australia. I'm, I'm a passionate believer in the power of education um, to, to change the way people see the world. Um, and I think uh, promoting intercultural understanding through this flow of students in both directions is a really important thing that a university can do. Are you also talking to other um, universities in Indonesia aside from UPH? Yes, we, we have a number of uh, relationships. Um, not all of them are as active as our, our, our relationship with UPR, mm -hmm. but um, and they, they take different forms. Some of them are driven by our own academic staff mm -hmm. um, who have a particular research interest. So I mentioned earlier that we teach Indonesian language, of course. Um, but some of our staff who teach Indonesian language are also very interested in, in Indonesian culture. Uh, so they pay regular visits here and have their own research relationships. Um, in fact, the, the list of in universities with whom we have some form of relationship here is it's about 20 or 25. Mm -hmm. um, but as I said, we'd like, to, we'd like to broaden and deepen that if we can. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Professor, Indonesia is at a crossroad here. Uh, the Asian economic community has just kicked off and, mm. and we're, we're entering a, tr a transition time here. Uh, there's an open economy where 600 million people, a market of 600 million people. The main concern for Indonesia will be the pool talent. Yes. Uh, there's a, a competition increases because now we are uh, a freer flow of, of people around around Southeast Asia. Yeah. Now, um, what would you think the uh, should be the focus of Jokowi's administration, for for instance, in the next few years to mm. increase the quality of its its pool talent? And, mm. and Indonesia is coming out into a different sy education system yes. as a two way um, communications between educators and students, yeah. and vice versa. Uh, your perspective on that? Well, I think um, like every economy in the world, um, one of the big challenges is, um, well, I think there are two big challenges. Um, one is social justice, uh, and the other is building human capital. Um, from a social justice point of view, I think all forms of post-secondary education are absolutely vital. They are the key to social mobility. Um, and I mean, as a, as a university educator, uh, I am a passionate believer in the power of a university education to, to promote that form of social mobility, to equip people to take advantage of the new economy. Um, but there's also that human capital argument. I think every government is going to be worried about where the, the, the knowledge workers, the professional classes, the people skilled in IT, where are they going to come from and how are we going to build the capacity to produce um, those, that next generation of the workforce. Again, I think universities are absolutely critical, um, but the challenge is, is to achieve the right balance, I think, between scale, um, that is equipping enough people with the right qualifications on the one hand, and quality on the other. Um, a, a lot of countries, for various reasons, have invested a lot in the very high end of their university system because they want to compete in the global rankings, right. they want you know the prestigious names, yeah. but often that can be at the expense of ensuring that enough people are getting the qualifications they need. Mm -hmm. So I think the interaction between the university sector 
and what you might call the vocational sector is really important in getting that balance right. I have to say, I think in Australia we've now got it wrong. Um, I think we're going in a very bad direction in, in Australia at the moment with... In, in, in sense of not getting that balance? Yes, yeah, so I, think, I think government has not invested enough in vocational education, mm. um, which is... Uh, we know that from Indonesia, for example, the demand for Australian vocational education is incredibly high. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's nearly doubled in the last five years. Mm -hmm. Now, the whole range of reasons for that, but I suspect that that's because uh, Indonesian families understand that a vocational qualification is going to be really, really mm -hmm. important. And Australia is a very good provider, in spite of government policy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I think, and this is not unique to Australia, it's not unique to Indonesia, I think every government faces this challenge of how to get the right balance between equipping enough of your population with those skills on the one hand and having the high-end research that can really help drive the next wave of innovation. Especially for Indonesia because in the two years of his administration uh, the education ministry is the only ministry that has seen its ministers changed uh, twice. Uh, yes. So yeah. I, I, we we believe it's a very challenging sector for 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 any of the ministers. Aside from also putting enough budget, as yes. you say, into education, yeah. not not specifically on vocational, but education yes. as a whole. Well, you have the fourth largest education system in the world. That's a huge challenge. I'm not surprised mm -hmm. that you're wearing ministers out mm -hmm. um, with that challenge. Access uh, to education alone is, 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 is a big issue in, in the country. Absolutely. Yes, it must be. Mm -hmm. um, and then making sure that you've got the right pathways through from school to post-secondary, whether that's vocational or higher education, and what form that higher education takes must be an, an enormous challenge. Mm -hmm. um, Australian universities can help. Um, we, we can help um, by providing um, policy advice and know-how on this. You know, we are very good at things like vocational education, we have some outstanding universities, um, but we can also help meet specific skills shortages. Um, so, I mean, going back to the health area, for example, it, I think it's a real shame that a La Trobe nursing student who is an excellent nurse can't come and practice here in Indonesia. In Indonesia. Uh, without doing a, 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 a requalification course, you know that that would contribute a huge amount to meeting what I gather is quite a serious skills gap here at the moment. Shortage. Yeah. Yes. So I think you know there are things that governments can do that would be quite easy to fix um, those sorts of shortages. Right. We'll talk more about that after the short break. Okay.